Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work with John Wayne Gacy, also known as the killer clown. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So here I'll be looking at the background of John Wayne Gacy, moving to the crimes, and then I'll look at the mental health and personality factors. Starting with the background, John Wayne Gacy was born on March 17, 1942, in Chicago, Illinois. His father, John Stanley Gacy, worked as a machinist, and his mother, Marion, was a homemaker. Gary had two sisters. He got along pretty well with them, but his relationship with his father was strained, as his father struggled with regulating alcohol intake, and he was physically violent toward everyone in the house. Gacy's father regularly beat him with his hands and with various objects. When Gacy was four years old, his father beat him with a leather belt after Gacy touched some of his father's car parts. Gacy stole a toy truck from a local store when he was six, which resulted in another beating. At one point, Gacy's father knocked him unconscious with a broomstick. When Gacy was somewhere around age seven, his father found out that Gacy, along with another boy, had played house with a 15-year-old girl who had an intellectual disability. Around that same time, it was discovered that Gacy was taking his mother's underwear. In addition to physical aggression, his father would often make demeaning comments toward Gacy, calling Gacy names that suggested he was unintelligent, not as good as his sisters, and would never be successful in life. At some point, one of his father's friends, a local contractor, molested Gacy. Gacy never told his father about that. In 1953, Gacy was on a playground when a swing struck him in the head. This caused a blood clot in his brain. He would have blackouts periodically for the next five years. When he was 18, he started dressing neatly, almost at a compulsive level. He also attached a blue light to his car and sped to the scene of accidents. Gacy started working as an assistant precinct captain for a Democratic Party candidate in 1960. In 1961, Gacy drove to Las Vegas, where he briefly worked with an ambulance service before being transferred to a mortuary assistant position. He would sleep on a cot that was positioned next to the room where the embalming was done. He would regularly watch the morticians as they embalmed bodies. Later, Gacy would say that one evening, he opened a coffin of a dead teenage male and caressed and embraced the body before feeling a sense of shock. He was fired because his boss found clothes of deceased individuals lying next to the caskets. After this, Gacy asked if he could return home, and he drove back to Chicago. Gacy enrolled in college. He graduated in 1963 and took a job as a management trainee at a shoe company. In 1964, the company transferred him to Springfield, Illinois, where he was to work as a salesperson. He was eventually promoted to management. Gacy became engaged around the same time. He would marry in September 1964. His wife's father bought three Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants in Waterloo, Iowa. Gacy and his wife moved there so he could manage those businesses. Gacy was to be paid $15,000 a year and a cut of the profits, a substantial amount of money at that time. He started to operate a sort of club in his basement where employees of the restaurant would come over and play pool, drink, and socialize. Gacy was particularly interested in talking to young men who worked for him, tending to ignore the young women. He would make frequent sexual advances toward the men, and if he was rejected, he would play it off as if he was just kidding around, or he would say he was just trying to test them and see if they would do it. Gacy and his wife would have a son and a daughter in 1966 and 1967, respectively. Later, Gacy referred to this time as perfect. In July 1966, Gacy's parents visited him and his wife. His father told him that he was wrong about him and apologized for all the harm he had caused when Gacy was younger. Now, when Gacy was back in Illinois, he became a member of this civic organization called the United States Junior Chamber, otherwise known as the JCs. This organization is only for young people. At the time Gacy was in this, the age range was 18 to 35. Now it's 18 to 40. Other members of the JCs found Gacy to be bombastic, 
obnoxious, and ambitious. In this particular chapter of the JCs, many of them were active in prostitution, illegal substance use, and swinging. Gacy was active in these activities as well. Starting in August 1967, Gacy committed an assault of a sexual nature. From this point forward in this video, when I use the word assault, that is the type to which I am referring. He went on to assault a number of young males. A few of them were deceived by Gacy. He would tell them he was conducting scientific research about homosexuality, and he would pay them for participating in that research. In March 1968, the first victim of his recent assaults reported the crime to his father, and eventually Gacy was charged. Gacy hired one of his 18-year-old employees to attack the victim so that the victim would not testify. The victim was able to identify his attacker, and this led back to Gacy. Gacy was arrested and charged for that attack and intimidation. He was ordered to undergo a mental health assessment. The mental health professional who assessed him determined he had antisocial personality disorder. They basically said he was hopeless. They reported that no therapy or medical treatment would be able to help Gacy. He was destined to be a menace to society. Now, this mental health professional was probably not a member of the Optimistic Therapist Club. However, in this particular case, they seem to be correct. Gacy was offered a plea deal where he would plead guilty to one charge. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. His wife divorced him. He would never see his wife or children again. Now, in prison, Gacy managed to get along well with the other prisoners. He joined the inmate chapter of the JCs. I find it interesting that some organizations actually had inmate chapters back then. I can understand why that would happen now because attitudes have shifted a bit, but back then it just seems out of place. Like somebody in the organization was looking at their membership and thought, we're going to need an inmate chapter, right? Like, these people are going to be arrested. I was thinking about other organizations that could have inmate chapters and how that chapter would be different from the one that's on the outside. Like would the inmate chapter of the Girl Scouts sell cookies with little files baked into them? I don't know. We see that Gacy increased that membership from 50 to 650, so he was quite successful with the JCs in prison. Gacy was released from prison in June of 1970. He only served a year and a half of his 10-year sentence. As a condition of his release, he needed to live with his mother in Chicago, which is what he did. He also started working as a short-order cook. In February 1971, he was arrested for assaulting a teenage male. When the victim did not appear in court, the charges were dismissed. The state of Iowa never found out about this charge, and in October of 1971, his parole in Iowa ended. Gacy bought a house with his mother and eventually started his own construction business. The annual revenue reached $200,000 by 1978. Gacy would commit his first murder in January 1972. I'll come back to the murders in a moment. I need to get through the rest of his background first. In June 1972, Gacy was arrested again for assault. This time the victim tried to blackmail him, so the charges were dropped. Gacy married for a second time in July 1972. Gacy had a number of young males working for him in his construction business. He would routinely harass them. Over the next few years, he would attempt to assault and assault several of them. In 1975, Gacy joined the Jolly Joker Clown Club. They would perform in various places like children's hospitals, parties, and political functions. So Gacy would dress up as a clown. That's where we get the name, the Killer Clown. Gacy would get divorced from his second wife in 1976, and after he told her that he was bisexual, and she observed him bringing teenage males into his garage. Many people noticed drastic changes in Gacy's behavior after his divorce. So now moving back to the murders. Gacy committed at least 33 homicides. All of Gacy's victims were male, and it's believed that all of them were young. Most of them were between the ages of 15 and 21. As I mentioned, the first murder was in January of 1972. It was a 16-year-old. The next murder was in January of 1974. This victim was never identified. Then there was another murder in July of 1975, an 18-year-old. Then we see that Gacy enters into what he referred to as his cruising years, which ran from 1976 to 1978. He murdered about 14 victims in 1976, about 11 in 1977, and about 5 
1978. If we add the three that I mentioned before, this gives us the 33 victims. Gacy's M.O. varied somewhat throughout his time committing murders, but generally he would pick up young men, encourage them to drink or use drugs, trick them into putting handcuffs on by saying it was a magic trick, assault and torture them, then strangle them to death. All the victims were murdered in Gacy's home, and all but the last two victims were murdered between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. The majority of the bodies were stored in Gacy's house, mostly in the crawl space. He also threw a few bodies in a nearby river. Gacy's last victim was killed in December 1978. Gacy had visited the victim in a store where the victim worked not long before the murder. The police investigated Gacy for some time because people had reported that the victim had seen Gacy. Eventually, Gacy confessed he would be charged with 33 counts of murder. Gacy's trial started in February 1980. The jury deliberated for less than two hours, finding Gacy guilty of all 33 counts. At that time, it was the largest number of murder convictions for one person in the history of the United States. Gacy would be sentenced to death. He would remain on death row for 14 years, filing and losing a number of appeals. He would be executed on May 10, 1994. Now moving to mental health and personality factors, I'll start by looking at his potential personality profile. I conceptualize personality using the five-factor model. I remember the big five traits using the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So as far as openness to experience, we see a high level. Gacy was artistic, creative, he had a number of fantasies, and he was intellectually curious. He had high conscientiousness. He was hardworking, ambitious, competent, and organized. His level of extroversion was high. He was outgoing, friendly, assertive, talkative, and sensation-seeking. His level of agreeableness was low. He was competitive, lacked empathy, was arrogant, and not straightforward. And we see his level of neuroticism was high. He was angry. He had a limited ability to resist temptation. He was depressed and anxious. However, he was able to remain calm under stressful circumstances. There are many different opinions about what was going on with Gacy's mental health. Looking at the testimony from the court proceedings, some of the terms that were used by the experts were official mental disorders, like what we see in the DSM, but others were not. Just to name a few of the terms that were used, borderline schizophrenia, borderline personality, paranoid schizophrenia, antisocial personality disorder, multiple personality disorder, mixed personality disorder. We see he was described as narcissistic, obsessive compulsive, hypomanic, psychotic, and atypically psychotic. Gacy attempted to convince the mental health professionals that he had multiple personality disorder. This would now be called dissociative identity disorder. He claimed to have several personalities, including the clown, the policeman, the politician, and the contractor. There was no agreement among the experts, but most of them believed he did not have multiple personalities. I think the best explanation for his behavior was antisocial personality disorder. His behavior aligns with all seven of the symptom criteria. Repeated criminal behavior, deceitfulness, impulsivity, aggressiveness, a reckless disregard for safety, irresponsibility, and a lack of remorse. It seems fairly clear that Gacy had a number of characteristics of psychopathy and narcissism, like being manipulative, grandiose, having a sense of entitlement, failing to take responsibility, superficial charm, fearless dominance, and lacking empathy. So why did Gacy become a serial killer? In some ways, Gacy is similar to other serial killers, and in other ways, he's remarkably different. Looking at the ways he's similar, he had a history of progressively more violent crime. He escalated from assault to assault and murder. He was mistreated when he was young. He had an interest in police work and impersonated a police officer. He had at least one head injury, and he had excessive sexual fantasies. Looking at the ways he was different, he really used a lot of torture and was particularly sadistic. Now, most serial killers are sadistic and involve themselves in torture. But Gacy took it to a new level. This seemed to be a major objective he was trying to complete through his crimes. Also, his victims were men. Most serial killers target women. He kept his bodies in his home. I find it interesting that Jeffrey Dahmer also targeted men and 
kept bodies in his home. Many victims did not report attempted assaults. This allowed Gacy to become prolific. He ran his own business, he made pretty good money, and he generally paid his bills. He would sometimes dress as a clown. I think Gacy did more damage to the reputation of clowns than any other single person in history. Now, a typical serial killer tends to be male and tends to target female victims. The way we tend to think of serial killing is that the murderer was rejected or mistreated by women, sometimes both. They internalize that treatment and they start to think poorly of themselves. Then that resentment and shame turns to anger. The killer targets women in order to make women pay for how the killer feels. Their mission is to completely dominate the victims and make them suffer because it brings the killer sexual gratification and satisfies their desire for revenge. In theory, a serial killer could have only one of those motives and still commit the murders. Can John Wayne Gacy fit into this paradigm? Can he fit into the way we tend to understand serial homicide? I think he can. Obviously, his expression of violence was toward men and not toward women, but other than that, I think this is one way we could think of this case. Instead of a poor relationship with his mother, Gacy had a poor relationship with his father. He felt rejected by his father. In addition, Gacy was bisexual. As part of that orientation, he had an interest in men. It's not clear if he ever wanted to have a true romantic relationship with a man, but it does seem clear that he wanted to have sex with men. Gacy gained more intense sexual gratification from killing males. So that heightened his experience. That is one of the things that made him pretty dangerous. Now there's another theory about Gacy that could explain his behavior as well. This theory says that when Gacy was killing, he was really playing the role of his father and thinking of the victim as himself. So his killings were motivated by self-hatred and to reenact the rage his father had for him. Like it hurt Gacy so badly that he felt like an awful person and he wanted to make himself pay even more. This desire gets converted into violence toward these innocent victims. This theory really doesn't explain how Gacy seemed to be so driven specifically to have sex with his victims, although it could explain the extreme level of sadism. This is a fascinating theory. It's very psychodynamic like dealing with parental love objects and transference, but I don't think it explains his behavior as well as the first theory. I believe Gary is essentially like many other serial killers, except he wanted to dominate men instead of dominating women. This takes us to the last question. Was John Wayne Gacy psychotic? Well, of course, he reported hallucinations and delusions, but other than the multiple personality theory, which not many people believed, convincing people that he was psychotic was his only chance of avoiding the death penalty. Of course, I don't know the answer to the question, but I haven't seen a lot of support for the psychosis theory. Again, some of the professionals said that he had schizophrenia, which of course is associated with psychosis, but they said he had paranoia. It really doesn't seem like he believed he was being persecuted or pursued by evil forces, although he did respond poorly to being under police surveillance. Now, Gacy did seem to have obsessive compulsive traits, like for the years he was in prison, he kept a log of his daily activity. There was also evidence of narcissism, like I talked about before. He developed stories about co-conspirators when he was in prison, I guess to give the court some reason to keep him alive, like he could help them catch the other people he said were involved. He seemed to honestly believe that he was going to win his appeals. Considering he confessed and they found the majority of the victims buried in his crawl space, it's incredible that he could have believed he would really ever be free. But that could just be narcissism. He didn't have to be psychotic to have that belief. There was one moment in a video recorded interview with a local TV channel in which the interviewer asked Gacy about a particular victim. Now, during the entire time he was in prison, Gacy always said he was innocent. This interview was no exception. When Gacy went to answer that question, he said about that victim, that's not one I killed. Only when the interviewer pointed out what Gacy said did he try to correct his mistake. He said he didn't mean that. That was an unusual mistake for somebody who is psychopathic and narcissistic, but again, it doesn't point to psychosis. I think one of the lessons that we can learn from the Gacy case is that it's important to report all crimes, even though that can be very challenging. 
almost everyone who commits horrible crimes committed only slightly less horrible crimes on prior occasions. Those are my thoughts on John Wayne Gacy. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.